Hello and welcome to FX. My name is Mark Dorsey. In this video, we'll be taking a look at Kant's lecture on FX. Now, hopefully, you've been following the series, so you've been know you know that we've been looking through Kant's um, universal practical philosophy. What we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be finishing up his section, which is if you again we're reading this book, which is his lecture on ethics. The first section of it is his discussion of really meta ethics and the universal practical philosophy. We're going to finish that up today. In fact, we're going to be starting here with his discussion of the grounds for the imputation moralis. So let's sort of begin and talk a little bit about what we mean. Now, again, just as a reminder, Kant is going to be using these Latin terms that come from his Baumgarten text that he's teaching out of, uh, but he's ultimately filtering that text through his own philosophical framework. So one of the things is just a quick reminder is that in our previous video, we made a distinction between the the difference between a state law and a moral law. A state law, of course, is the sort of legal law that you're obligated to follow as a citizen of, uh, of the society you live in. Um, and the state laws are different in principle from the sorts of moral laws that we're ultimately evaluating. Now, there is certainly a relationship between the law and morality here, uh, but we're going to see that there is also important differences regarding, for instance, the freedom of responsibility, and the sorts of judgments we make. So moral judgments seem to be a little bit harsher, if you will, than legal judgments, but legal judgments have the ability to be enforced, whereas it doesn't look like moral judgments can be enforced. So there's a sort of interesting symmetrical inverse relationship between, if you will, human governmental law and the moral universal law that Kant is interested in when he thinks here about morality. So that's in the background. You're going to see throughout the rest of today's video that this distinction between the state law and moral law is a very important distinction that Kant is operating with. Now, in this section, Kant is looking at the grounds for the imputation of morality. So let's think a little bit about what that means. What is imputation? Well, imputation is the act of imputing. And what does that mean? Well, to impute is to credit a person or a cause and then to lay the responsibility and blame. So that's what imputation means. It's essentially the way in which we assign and credit the responsibility or blame of a specific action. So which means that when we're talking about moral imputation, we're talking about the ways in which we can credit blame or responsibility uh, morally to agents who act. So that's ultimately what we're going to be taking a look at. And of course, Kant will also sort of consistently distinguish the form of imputation in morality with the type of imputation we see within state law. Now, I'm going to call this the taxonomy of imputation. And here what we see the Kant starts to do is sort of lay down the conceptual groundwork to understand the differences of, between state and moral or ethical imputation. In other words, one thing we can say, though, is that Kant does make a distinction in the previous year between ethical laws and moral imputation. What he's going to say here is that Actually, both the legal laws, the state laws, and the ethical laws, also both of them enable moral imputation. So in other words, when you break a legal law, you're also breaking a moral law. Uh, or in other words, there is a sort of moral responsibility that comes along with breaking a legal law. It's the same thing with an ethical law. So this will be important. Now, when we talk about the imputation of morality, we can talk about it in, either in terms of its meritum or its merit, in other words, it's praiseworthiness, or we can talk about the imputation, the moral imputation for demeritum or the demerit, in other words, the blameworthiness. So really what Kant has in mind here is that when we lay blame or responsibility on people for their actions, we either can do so in ways in which we recognize the merit of someone's action and we praise that action, or we recognize the deficiency or the demerit of that action and thereby place blame. So there's a positive and a negative aspect here to imputation. Now, keep going here. The, but the moral imputation is not always the same for the state and ethical law. And Kant gives a number of examples here, although I think we could probably give many others, right? So for instance, one thing that Kant says here is that fulfilling a legal requirement doesn't give one moral merit. So if I'm required to pay taxes, right, when I fulfill that by paying my taxes, I don't, I'm not given moral merit for that. In other words, I'm not praised morally for simply doing what is a requirement of me. 
Um, conversely, the transgression of a state or an ethical law does entail demerit, right? So when I break a, a legal law, then I'm blamed for something. When I break an ethical law, I'm also blamed for something. Another distinction would be that when I follow a state law or a legal law, that doesn't mean that one gets the merit of a reward, right? Uh, but it's clear that if you break, if you transgress the law, you will get the demerit of a punishment, right? What we can say, though, is that any time we comply with an ethical law, it is always meritous. In other words, there's always something to be praised when we comply with a moral or an ethical law, uh, though there isn't always merit for complying with a legal requirement. So there's sort of an interesting way in which we can break down the imputation here between the state and the moral laws. An example here that might be helpful is think about the notion of, think about the racist, right? A person who is racist and makes racist remarks, right? That's not illegal, but you might say that it is unethical. Notice here that, for instance, that means that there's, that means that the person who makes racist jokes we can hold them being morally responsible, but we can't compel a punishment for that, right? Um, but conversely, a person who's not racist, who does fulfill a sort of moral law there, that person we can recognize that they deserve praise for that. Um, so it's sort of interesting here. Uh, but notice that you can never compel that which is moral. At least you can't compel it the way that you can compel a legal obligation by essentially, you know, enacting punishment for those people who don't um, fulfill that obligation or duty. Now, one thing here, as we can see, is that merit involves a positive consequence of some sort. Now, a positive consequence here can either be a reward or it can be a punishment. So Kant says on page 61, quote, but no such consequences accrue either from the observance of state laws or from the transgression of ethical laws. So when you transgress an ethical law, you don't get a punishment. And when you observe a state law, you don't get a reward, right? <laughs> you just don't, you just avoid the punishment. So it's sort of interesting here. Whereas you might say, and Kant implies here, that if you fulfill an ethical law, you are praiseworthy of a reward. Um, and when you transgress a legal law, you are uh, deserving of a punishment. So it's sort of an inverse relationship. It's a bit of a long quote here, but let me lay it at your feet. Kant argues, quote, there is no meritum, there's no merit, and so no reward in the one case, and, those, and no demeritum, and so no punishment in the other. If I comply with the law of the state by discharging the debt, for example, the consequences are purely negative, right? But if I transgress such a law, the consequences are positive. In other words, I incur a punishment. Similarly, if I comply with an ethical law, the consequence is positive, namely there's a reward. Thus, the observance of the laws of the state carries with it no positive consequence of reward, and the transgression of ethical laws carried with it no positive consequence of punishment. That, in other words, is just another way of describing this inverted relationship between state law and moral law in Kant's sort of world. Now, now next week, Kant begins to talk about the imputation of factums, now, or facti. What is a facti? Well, a facti is the plural of a facta. Well, what is a facta? A fact is a deed, it's an action, right? So here we want need to distinguish the idea that you can have a moral action, or I'm sorry, you can have a pure action, but not all actions are the consequence of our free choice, right? Because there are some actions which are necessary. So a necessary deed is not free, it can therefore not be imputed. In other words, if, you're, if there's an action which is totally necessary, then we don't hold you, we don't either praise or blame a person for doing that action because it's necessary. We only praise or blame, we only impute for those actions which can be chosen out of freedom, right? In other words, we only hold people responsible for the things that they can and choose to do. We don't hold them responsible for the things that they have to or are unable to change, right? So in ethics, we have sort of reverse interesting case here, right? which is we can't be held responsible for the facta which are not in accordance with the ethical law because the omission to do something which we are not bound to do is no action. Um, so this has a sort of interesting case. Also, what we can say here is that ethical laws are not coercive. You can't force a person to become moral. 
But state laws are coercive. You can force a person and coerce a person to abide by their moral or, I'm not their moral, but their legal duties, right? So in other words, you can't um, force a person to, to stop making racist remarks, but you can legally force a person to pay taxes, right? Uh, just to use those two examples that we've mentioned before. Now, in state law, we're only held responsible for evil actions. So that means, in other words, in state law, we, uh, we're only required not to do the things which are wrong, right? <laughs> Essentially, right? And when we do things which are wrong, in other words, when we commit evil actions, that's when the state law, the legal system, kicks in and we're held responsible. But in ethics, we're actually held to account in con conspue for those actions which are good in themselves. So it's interesting here. State law is really concerned with the coerciveness of stopping people from committing evil actions. Whereas the moral law is actually about, uh, there is no coercion, but it is concerned with us fulfilling and doing those actions which are actually the right sorts of actions. Uh, so it's a very sort of interesting dichotomy that Kant is beginning to set up here between the way in which laws uh, filter through in terms of the state on the one hand and in terms of the moral law on the other. We can next kind of talk about the degrees of responsibility. So <clears throat> to impute is to, is to declare whether or not someone should be praised or blamed. It's, it's to lay, um, it's to identify or credit someone with the cause of an action. But now we need to talk about, okay, once we recognize and can impute uh, the act, an action, um, the next question is, well, okay, we're talking there really about responsibility. Who's responsible for the action morally? And it looks like Kant says that there are degrees of responsibility. So this is very important. It's, Kant's view is not that you either have 100% responsibility or 100% no responsibility. He rather sees responsibility as a spectrum. And so we can talk about the degrees of responsibility. Now, what are these degrees of responsibility? Well, they, can, they are directly associated with the degrees of freedom which we enjoy in terms of our action. So the more freedom we have, then the more responsibility gets entailed towards our actions. The less responsibility we have, then that means that the less freedom we had in making those actions. And here this makes a lot of sense, right? So it, for instance, notice that if, um, um, let's see here, if I have no freedom, for instance, Here's an example. Think about the soldier who's required, um, who's, you know, forced to shoot another person as a part of his duties, right? Well, in this case, we could say that the soldier, in a certain way, doesn't have the freedom to choose whether or not to shoot. That is up to their uh, commanding officer, which means that we don't hold that soldier responsible for the action. Who do we hold responsible? We hold the commanding officer responsible. Now, in terms of thinking about soldiers, there is a code of conduct for soldiers, and so there is a certain degree of responsibility that all soldiers have, because it's assumed that all soldiers have the freedom, uh, have a certain degree of freedom, ultimately. Um, at least that would be a sort of Kant's sort of moral analysis. Now, the question though is, what exactly does freedom entail? And it looks like here that Kant identifies sort of three important criteria for establishing whether or not someone has freedom, or at least establishing the degree of freedom that a person has. Now, the first thing is a person has to have, in order to be free, a person, in order to have a free action, I should say, a person has to have the capacity to act. So if a person doesn't have the ability, right, then we can't hold them, to, we can't say that they're free to do that sort of thing. Um, so for instance, think about a person who, who may have lost their legs in an accident. This person no longer has the capacity to walk which means they don't have the freedom to walk because they don't have that ability, right? So you need ability or capacity in order to have freedom. Number two, Kant says you have to have the cognizance of the impulsive ground for the action. In other words, you have to have knowledge of the reason for your action in order for you, in order for Kant to say that you're really acting under freedom or you're acting freely. So you have to know why you're acting. You have to have you have to understand the reasons here. So in other words, the person who's irrational isn't probably free because the person who's, not, who's irrational 
in all likelihood does not have the cognizance of the impulsive grounds uh, that are motivating their actions. Number three is you have to have objectivity. In other words, you have to be cognizant of the objective character of an action. So let's take this in turn. So freedom requires the ability, it requires a recognition of the reason for the action, but it also requires a recognition or a cognizance or knowledge of the objectivity of your action. Um, so, for example, Kant gives two interesting sort of examples here to talk about this. He gives the example of a child who destroys something of value or something that's useful. Imagine, for instance, that a child, uh, let's say you have a computer and a child um, destroys the computer because they think that it's a fun thing to do. Well, in this case, the child is not really free because the child lacks the object, lacks the cognizance of the objective character of their action, right? The child is merely thinking of the computer as something that is for them to play with. They're thinking of, they're cognizant, the child's merely cognizant of the subjective character of their action, not the objective character. For instance, many parents often complain that their children don't recognize other, the, the way in which other people factor into their actions. In other words, they lack the cognizance of objectivity. Um, another example here he gives is of the drunkard. So Kant says the person who's drunk and commits actions that are morally bad, right? While they're drunk, they're no longer free, right? Because they lack the they lack the cognizance for the impulsive grounds of their action. And in fact, if the person's really drunk, they may even lack the capacity to act one way or another. They're they're out of control, as it were. But what Kant does say is that the drunkard is responsible for getting drunk in the first place because. Before they were drunk, they had a capacity to choose, uh, and they had the they had reason, they had cognizance of um, both of objectivity and of the impulsive grounds of their action, and yet they still chose to get drunk. So what you can say here is that the person who's drunk, who commits an act, can't be held responsible maybe for the actual action that they they do while they're drunk, but they can be held morally responsible for the fact that they chose to get drunk. Notice here, for instance, that when you think of drunk driving, for instance, we don't we have a law against drunk driving, right? But the law is that you can't drive while drunk, right? The law is not that you is we don't have a law against getting in accidents while you're drunk, right? We have a law against getting drunk in the first place before you step into a vehicle, and this seems to parallel Kant's own sort of example of the drunk. Driving. Um, so freedom entails these sorts of three things, right? So, and by the way, notice here is that if freedom entails these things, then that means that responsibility is linked precisely with each of these three things as well. So what this means is that the less freedom there is, the less responsibility we have. Kant says the degree of moral, the degree of the morality of an action, ought not to be confused with the degree of the responsibility for the factum. So there's an interesting thing here. What is a factum? Well, the factum is the fact of the action. So let's be clear here that uh, the, the, there is um, the degree of the morality of an action can't be confused with the degree of the responsibility for the factum. So in other words, uh, we have to distinguish here the notion that of the, we have to distinguish the action in terms of it being an actual thing that just occurred, a fact of your living, right, from the morality. So for instance, the drunk driver who gets in a car accident, the, the actual getting into the accident part is the factum of their action. And they're responsible for that, right, because they did it. But morally, they're not responsible for the factum per se. They're, responsi they're responsible for the conditions which led to that factum. So Kant says, quote, The more I have to force myself to do an action, the more obstacles I have to overcome in doing it, and the more willfully I do it, the more is to be held, the more it is to be accounted to me. And for that reason, it is all the less accounted to me if I leave it undone. So his notion here is that one of the things we notice here is that the more I strive to do something, and the more I have to overcome in doing it, that reveals a greater sense of freedom and therefore a greater sense of responsibility. But conversely, the reverse is true, right? Such that uh, the less I do the less I aim to do something, the more I leave undone, really the less responsible I'll be for 
that thing because I didn't do it, right? So, it, by the way, it's at this point that Kant raises this interesting remark, which I find quite antiquated, but it'll be interesting to see maybe what you think, uh, which is Kant's view of sensuality, right? So when he's talking about responsibility, he suddenly starts talking about our, the difference between our natural appetites and our lustful appetites, right? Of course, lust, think of here, has to do with sensuality and sex, right? Um, his argument here is that when he's talking about natural appetites, he's thinking of like hunger and thirst and the, the impulse to breathe and things like that. And he says that we have less responsibility for those things. So if we act in such a way in, in which we're in accordance with our natural appetites, we have less moral responsibility because it's a natural appetite, which means we have less free choice. But what's interesting here is that Kant seems to argue that when it comes to lust, when it comes to sexual or sensuality, we have more responsibility. And his view seems to be because we have more freedom, right? He says, quote, sensuality is a thing which can be eradicated. We can prevent it taking deep root. If, therefore, a man does a thing because sensuality drives him to it, he must be held more responsible than when he is driven by hunger. And so I find this a very interesting and I also find it antiquated. Because his view seems to be here is that it's a very sort of classic, I would say, Germanic Protestant view here, which is the notion that that we can uh, bring our own sensual desires into, um, we can bring them under the conformity or the direction of our will. And so his view here is that if you, is, is that because, his view is that we have greater amount of freedom over our sexuality and our sensuality than we do over these other sorts of natural appetites. But what I find, it's interesting, my own view personally would be that most of our sensuality and our sensual appetites are also natural appetites. And I think many people would agree with this. But you can see here how Kant's view is, I don't know, maybe antiquated is too harsh, but it's quite Victorian, I guess. Um, and so it, it's interesting here because this might be a point of contention, but... It is interesting because, you know, think of all of the sort of sex scandals that people have um, or politicians and celebrities have. And here, he seems to be indicating that when it comes to sex scandals, there is a greater degree of uh, responsibility because there is a greater degree of your ability to control yourself than there is in these other natural appetites. So that's sort of an interesting thing, and I wanted to sort of point it out because... Uh, it's not something that I think you'll typically see a contemporary philosopher discussing uh, or making that same point. Now, Kant then is now going to one thing he does say is that the external forces that are put upon us to act in such a way decrease our subjective responsibility. Um, so, for instance, this is maybe the example of the soldier who's being commanded to shoot innocent children, right? Now, Kant would say is that that soldier has a moral responsibility not to do that. But clearly, if you have a commanding officer who is telling you to do something, you have an external force that is bearing down upon you. And this seems to decrease the, the sort of responsibility we would hold subjectively to that individual. Kant says, quote, the, man, the more a man is driven to action by external forces, the less is he responsible but if he overcomes the external pressure and does not act in accordance with it, his merit is greater. So it's sort of an interesting problem. And it's, it's noteworthy that Kant doesn't see this as a problem for his own sort of moral framework here. Because what he's saying here is that if you have lots of external force and pressure upon a person, then we're going to hold you less responsible. But if a person is able to overcome that and sort of climb their way out of that external pressure, then we say they have greater, more, they have, we can impute more moral merit towards that person. Um, and so it's sort of interesting um, observation, I think, of Kant. Um, I'm not convinced that it fully is consistent with his, all of his other views, but um, that is what he argues. Now, the intention to do a thing does not entail merit, though, right? So just because you intend to do something doesn't necessarily entail at least legal merit. Only the action seems to entail merit. But Kant really tells us here that we place blame or praise for, for things which are done, not really for things which we intend to do, right? But this doesn't mean that our intentions don't have moral worth. Kant's view is actually the reverse, that our intentions certainly do have moral worth. Now, in order to sort of lay out and spell out this point, 
Aristotle makes this sort of distinction by pulling again from the Latin. And he makes a distinction between the conatus of an action and the propositi uh, of an action. Right? The conatus here is something like the effort of the undertaking, whereas the propositi is the proposal to act. It's just the idea that I should go do something, the proposition of the action, if you will. Now, here's what he says is he says that state laws attempt to deduce the conatus by inferring from the result of an action. So notice here is that if think about here is that how does the how does the because in our legal system, if you intend to do something, that has more moral if you intend to act and then act, that has more uh, legal responsibility attached to it than if you do something without the intention of doing it. Right? So how do you figure out the effort of the undertaking? Um, and the answer is you infer it from the result of the action. So you sort of take a look at all the actions that are undertaken, and whatever those results of the action were, you infer what the effort, what effort was built into the action. But notice here that our legal laws don't impute the conatus the same way that the ethical laws do. So again, we're back to this distinction between the legal versus the moral, right? So, for example, Kant gives an example of a man with a dagger is caught before the murder, right? So imagine you're sitting in a room, God forbid, and someone jumps in and they have a huge dagger, and they, and they yell out, I'm going to kill you, kill Joe, and they start running towards Joe. But then you grab the, you grab the person, you know, you wrestle them, you pull the weapon out of their hand, and so forth. Now, now compare the way in which the, the legal system will approach it versus the moral case. Now, in terms of the legal says, you're not going to charge the person with murder because they didn't actually murder anyone, even though they intended to do it, right? Um, and even though they may actually have a conatus of doing it, we, what we do is we charge a person with the attempted murder, right, in that case. Uh, but notice we don't charge them with murder because what we do is we, we take a look at the result of the action. And in this case, because we were able to stop the murderer, right, the result of the action is different. And so attempted murder has a lesser consequence than an actual murder. Now, look at this now. Look at the same case, but from the moral perspective. And, and Kant's view is going to be here is that, well, listen, the, the person, the murderer who runs in with the dagger and yells, I'm going to kill Joe, right? that person has, um, they are morally responsible for their intention to act, and they have the intention of murder. So that means that they're morally responsible not for murder in terms of its activity, because the action never occurred, but they are responsible for the intention, the mur their murderous intentions. So in other words, the moral side of the house is going to have a greater sense of responsibility, and it's going to link more responsibility to intention than the legal side of the house, if you will. And Kant's distinction here between the, the conatus and the propositi is a way that allows him to begin to sort of parse those things. Because in morality, quote, a complete propositum is as good as the executed deed. Only the propositum must be such that it could be carried out in practice unaltered, because it actually often happens that the propositum is changed before its actual execution. So in other words, right, the intention to act imputes a moral responsibility, while in state law, only the deed itself can garner legal responsibility. Okay? So this is sort of a way in which we can begin to deduce the, the fine grade difference between our evaluation of moral intention versus our evaluation of legal intention. And they do seem to be different. Now Kant sort of turns his attention here to a subject that I find very interesting. And this is the relationship between habits and responsibility. Because it's clear that most of our actions are actually the result of hab habits and of habitual conduct. Um, and notice here that the more we, we ingrain a habit, the more automatic that habit becomes. So it raises the question that as a habit becomes more automated in our life, right, there are, does our responsibility increase or decrease, right? Um, here's what Kant says on page 64. Quote, the man for whom a certain action has become a necessity through a habit is called a kunsudorin. Uh, Stadorinarius, and forgive me for all of you who speak Latin out there. I know I've completely butchered that um, that word there, right? He says, habit makes an action easy until at last it becomes a necessity. Now, notice earlier Kant said that 
when an action is sort of necessary, then you're no longer free to choose otherwise. So this is where the problem comes in. Such necessity as a result of habit, because it fetters our will, diminishes our responsibility. Yet, the actus through which the habit is acquired must be imputed to us. So it looks like what Kant's saying here is that when your actions become totally habitualized, then they become necessary for you. At that point, you have a diminished sense of responsibility. But the action you took in order to gain that habit, right, or to acquire that habit, is where your full sense of responsibility seems to lie. Um, so you have this sense of the habitual conduct, um, is that the, the, the more, and here, think about the criminal or the drug addict. The drug addict becomes subject to a habit that they can no longer control. So how do we um, hold them responsible? Well, we hold the drug addict responsible for their initial action, the actus they took in order to acquire that habit. I guess their first, uh, their first drug use or something. Okay, so what we see here is that habit is a proof of frequent repetition of the action. And so it increases the responsibility to be imputed. So there is a way in which the more you you repeat these things, there is a way in which the responsibility seems to, to gain, even though it also seems to diminish in terms of its degree, right? So you, so this sort of reveals to us that there's at least two conditions of human nature that seem to limit the imputability of our actions. And Kant identifies these as A, weakness, and B, infirmity, or one weakness and two infirmity, to stick with the slides here. Now, what is weakness? Human weakness for Kant is the lack of the degree of the moral goodness that's required to make its actions adequate to the moral law. So Kant's view here is that human weakness is a, is a lack of moral goodness, right? Uh, it's, a na it's a negative thing, right? Whereas infirmity, by contrast, for human infirmity for, for Kant is, quote, the presence of a strong principle and a motive to evil action. So in other words, what we're talking about here is weakness is an inability to be good, whereas infirmity is the ability of acting out of evil, right? So what we have here is Kant is sort of making the distinction that some people lack enough goodness to do what's right, and other people have this really positive sense of being evil, right? They, it's not that they lack, it, they lack the good, they actually rather seem to have something more than that. They actually have evil in their hearts, I guess, right? Now, here's the question, though, is what is the supreme good of impulse to action, right? What should actually motivate us to action? And it, Kant's answer here is this, the rectitudo moralis. Now, what the heck is that? Well, the rectitudo moralis is the moral purity of an action. Kant writes, quote, morality consists in this, that an action should arise from the impulsive ground of its own inner goodness, and this is a matter of moral purity. So in other words, Kant's view here is that, and go back to the categorical imperative we talked about in a couple of videos ago, right? Is that Kant's view is that Every action that's moral is good in and of itself. And that pure inner goodness, implicit in, in, or inherent to the action itself, is what should actually motivate us to act. That's the supreme ground of action. Now, it's obvious that there are other grounds that motivate us to act besides this, but his argument is that the goodness of an action should be the supreme or the ideal thing that motivates us to act. So if that's the case, how do we deal with human weakness? Because it looks like that we're quite weak when it comes to the supreme ground because we have other impulses for action which don't seem to correlate to this. And that seems to be a moral weakness. Well, Kant criticizes, well, let me read you this quote. He says, quote, moral laws must never take human weakness into account but must be enunciated in their perfect holiness, purity, and morality without any regard to man's actual constitution. So what Kant's going to argue here is that Within the side of the state law or the legal system, sure, you can look at human weakness and maybe, you know, diminish punishments and things like that. You can take people's actual constitution into account when you're passing, moral, passing legal judgment. But when it comes to passing moral judgment, Kant's view is that it doesn't matter what people's actual constitution is. What you have to do is you have to think about things in their absolute pure ideal sense. And this is because ultimately for Kant, 
the development or the understanding of moral law is grounded in reason. And reason is objective to all. And so it doesn't matter what your constitution is. You have to know what is right um, morally in, the, in the, the greatest sense. So it's interesting, at this point, Kant actually criticizes a number of the ancient philosophers. And here we can include Aristotle. And since in this video series we read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, you'll know that for Aristotle, for him, it's always happiness is an activity of the soul, a natural activity of the soul, right? And so for Aristotle, morality ultimately is about human nature. And Kant criticizes this because he thinks that this is a, the, what these ancient philosophers are doing is they're accommodating morality to human nature. In other words, they're diminishing um, the moral law. Kant says the law in itself must be pure and holy for the reason that it must be a model, a pattern, a standard, and as such it must be exact and precise or it could not be the basis of a judgment. So it's the objectivity of these things that is at stake. In order for us to have objective moral judgments, we have to recognize what the highest moral standard is. And we can't just change that moral standard simply because some of us um, have moral weaknesses and some of us have certain forms of infirmity, right? We have to maintain the objectivity of the law in terms of its moral purity, its rational purity for Kant, or its categorical purity, right? So this means that the presentation of the moral law in its pure form is itself a moral duty. So it's, it's sort of, this is sort of, if you will, a meta-moral duty. Not only do you have a moral duty to fulfill the moral law, you have a duty to present the moral law in its highest, most supreme, pure form. So now let's look here at infirmity, and I've sort of talked about it. But infirmity, of course, is a positive evil, right? It's not merely the absence of good. So this is the difference, for instance, think about, for instance, uh, the person who who lies um, because they're tempted and they lack the goodness of being honest. That's a weakness. But think about the person who lies on purpose in order that they can gain they can, they can gain something from you. That seems to be a form of infirmity. It's a positive evil. It's not really the absence of doing what's good. Moral evil is a result of freedom, right? So that means that our infirmities are also the result of freedom. That is, it's the result of choice in some sense. And it's likely that our infirmities come from choosing things and then developing habits out of those, right? Um, he doesn't talk about habits in this regard, but I think that he would, if he were here, we could talk to him. I think he would make that link, uh, especially since he's doing it in the same chapter already. But he does articulate what he calls the first principle of the infirmity of human nature, which is namely this, that in judging the actions of others, I must pay no heed to the infirmity of the human nature. In other words, I ignore the infirmity. Again, it's always about the purity of the, pre the, purity of the moral law. So the infirmity of human nature doesn't actually mitigate our moral responsibility. It might mitigate our legal responsibility, but it doesn't mitigate our moral responsibility. He says, quote, I may find all manner of excuses which would satisfy an earthly judge, but it's nothing that the human nature is frail. His concern is only with the action as it is. So this sort of leads Kant into this question of, well, who is the judge? Who can judge these things? He says all reasonable humans actually have the capacity to make moral judgments. And so in that sense, all humans are the judge. All of us. We are our own judge. But only the legal judge has the authority to enforce punishments. right? So all of us can be a moral judge, but only certain individuals who have been granted authority can become the legal judge. And this, of course, makes a lot of sense. A person with the authority and the power to make valid judgments and to enforce them constitutes what Kant calls legally a forum. Now, a forum can either be a single individual or a forum can be multiple individuals. And the notion here is that the judge who's competent is ultimately a forum. Now, a judge is not competent either if his or her understanding is inadequate or if he or she lacks the authority to judge because it's been taken away from them or abrogated or if the factum doesn't fall under the law with which the, his or the judge's authority deals with, right? So in other words, we have sort of three criteria that a competent judge has to meet. On the one hand, a judge has to have competence of understanding, or that's to have an adequacy of understanding, I guess. Number two, 
uh, they also have to have the authority to judge, right? And number three, they also have to uh, have the relevance of their judgment, right? That is, their authority has to be relevant to the type of action which is under um, scrutiny. So let's just say that is the criteria. You have to have adequacy of understanding. You have to have the authority and relevance. And then finally, I'm sorry, you have to have authority. And then finally, you have to have the relevance. It has to be, has to be relevant to that judge. Now, when we talk about forum here, there's two kinds of forum. On the one hand, there's the external forum, which is the human form of government that you can imagine we're mainly talking about with regard to a legal judge. But there's also the internal form, the subjective form. And this is what Kant calls the conscience. Now, all of us know that we have a moral conscience, and Kant will call this a moral feeling. His view here is that a forum ought to exercise compulsion. So a forum compels you to do something, right? Um, so obviously a, a judge in a courthouse can compel me to do something, but he also recognizes that we have these moral feelings which compel us to act in certain ways, and they, they compel us to make judgments that ought to have the force of law. Now, what is the conscience? The conscience for Kant is an instinct to judge and pass sentence on our actions. So it's an instinct, which means it's not a faculty. Um, a faculty is commensurate with the freedom of the will. In other words, a faculty is something you can control. Kant's view here is that the conscience is not something you control. It is rather something which kicks in regardless of the will. It speaks to us regardless of what we choose to do. He says, quote, we all have a faculty of speculative judgment at our will's discretion, but there's something else within us which compels us to judge our actions and which points us to the law, and that is a true judge. In other words, that's what the conscience is. So the external form can have no jurisdiction over our dispositions, but it looks like the internal form does have jurisdiction over our dispositions. Quote, ethical actions are not within the competence of the form externum humanum, um, humanum because external compulsion is not their sanction. The external grounds of accountability are those which derive their derivability, which derive their validity from the external universal laws. So ultimately, at the end of the day, what we see here is that the conscience plays an incredible role for Kant um, in terms of the moral feeling which ultimately allows us for us to cast judgment on our own actions. Um, and this is important for morality, because obviously when I make a moral action, that's not something that, it, that I'm going to be called in, before a court in, in order to make a count of. But, so how do I pass judgment on these moral activities which are not subject to the legal system? The answer, the conscience. So the conscience is very, very important. And Kant ultimately would link this up with this notion of the goodwill, right? Where there's a recognition that we ought to act in conformity with the universal law. Um, and the universal law, are, these are going to be those categorical laws that we talked about in a previous video. Now that sort of concludes our discussion, and it wraps up our discussion of Kant's um, discussion of the universal, uh, the universal practical philosophy. What we're going to look at next is Kant's ethics, where he sort of begins to take specific things. In particular, we're going to look at his discussion of what our duties towards others are. We're going to also look to his analysis of friendship, and we'll compare that with Aristotle's. But also we'll take a look at his discussion of enmity, and also the duties that are dictated by justice. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at in our next video on Kant's lecture on ethics and in his practical moral philosophy. Okay? Thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you found this interesting, um, and I hope you're getting something from this. Okay? If anything, I think you'll probably be getting a wider, more nuanced view of Kant's moral philosophy. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys online.